Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Emporia State University and uh, tonight's reading uh, from the Emporia Writers Group. This is being sponsored tonight by uh, Liber the ESU Library uh, Archives, and uh, we'd like to thank them for uh, making this possible for all of us. We have several writers assembled from uh, the Emporia Writers Group this evening, and uh, we will go ahead and get this started with our first reader of the evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Deb Ursik. Hello, I'm going to read a couple of poems. Um, this one I kind of took from something that I wrote several, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> several years ago, and then put a poem together out of it. It's called The Symphony of Silence. <clears throat> the trees glisten with new fallen snow. The wind whispers and rustles leaves. I hear the whispers, the snap of a twig, the song of a cardinal. The swish of my skis as I bump along, the orchestration of nature rises and falls in the shadows of the trees. A heated twittering from a thicket scolding me for my intrusion. A chattering squirrel bounds effortless, effortlessly and soundlessly across the snow. The birds are forgiving of my blunder and now chirp and sing their parts with no obvious rhythm or rhyme. The wind adds a shudder, a flutter, and retreats holding its breath only to inflict, inflect again more intensely making the slender trees creak and sway, adding natural notes to the harmony, the masterpiece, the symphony of silence. And this second poem is one that I wrote several years ago. And I just think that right now with all everything going on that it kind of fits, so. Uh, not only in the political world, but in just in the world. It's called responsibility. No news is good news, or so it is said, but we cannot ignore what we've seen or read. The world's in trouble, there's more to come. It can't be taken lightly, there's nowhere to run. Rivers barely flowing, air quality is poor. Children are growing, going hungry, dad's been shown the door. With preservatives, cavities, derivatives, and additives, it's my life, teenage attitudes, and I can fix it political platitudes. What it boils down to, I can clearly see, each one of us must take responsibility. We are the ones to blame for the mess we're in, not anyone or everyone or your evil twin. Give the bike a whirl, cut up the plastic. You'll lose a pound or two and find your budget's elastic. Our founding fathers had big shoes and all, so ask the question, are my shoes too small? Can we make changes in all this we own? Take the responsibility for the seeds we've sown. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Great to hear from you this evening. Our next, uh, our next uh, presenter, reader tonight is uh, ESU's uh, own Lindsay Bartlett. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, I'm going to read two poems tonight. Uh, both of these are poems that I have read in some other form um, at First Fridays, back when they used to be open mics at First Fridays. And um, I have edited them since then and figured I would read them tonight. They're, they're both different. Um, one of them is more nature related and then the other one is um, about a little girl in my life who I really care about. Okay, so the first one is the nature related one and it is called rural animity, which is always hard for me to say, so I apologize if I stumble over that word. On the prairie grain, or on the prairie grain elevators dot the land like push pins on a map, dot it marking all the places I haven't been. On these Western Kansas plains, cattle and stone posts are more common than people. Where Kansas is associated with Dorothy and that witch from the West, my hometown boasts of its barbed wire fame, the stuff settlers used to divide up the vast prairie in order to make a living from the good earth. In a place where at night they could look up and see the night sky, 
the same sky we see a little less clearly now. Those of us who have stayed, called these planes home, taken what anemone we could in their vastness. And my second poem is called Reading the Nutcracker, and this is for Miranda. A single dad and his three-year-old daughter live in the duplex next to mine, a laundry room, a shared space. On any given night, there will be sporadic knocks at my door from a little fist, followed by the patter of tiny feet as she runs to hide. I open the door and pretend to search. Grin at her squeals when she sees me. Lindsay, come play with me, she says. Tonight we read the Nutcracker, sitting on the wood floor, her elbow against my knee. I've watched her grow. Just a few months ago, she would not have cared about this story. Now she sits fascinated, stopping me only to point out pictures of girls in pretty dresses. Otherwise, she lets me read. You can see her absorbing the words, three-year-old brain like a sponge. I don't know how much I can give to her, but at least I can share a love of stories and words, the things most important to me. One day, maybe these things will be the same to her. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Good to hear from you this evening. Uh, next, we have Carrie Moyer. Carrie, let me get the video on you, and there we go. Good to have you with us tonight, Carrie. Hello, good to be here. So I have a few selections that are going to be in the next book. So um, I'm going to read from those. So I'm going to start with one called Red Tomatoes. Red tomatoes from the garden picked, placed into a wicker basket on the counter. And Grandpa asks, would you like to take some home? Grandpa's blue eyes over the top of glasses, his busy hands already finding the plastic bag. And I would say yes, like always, for love, for him to give, for me to receive from his garden. And then coffee, the news of the day, before Grandpa would go to his recliner and nap. That was Red Tomatoes. And this is called uh, Tangled. To drop like a stone into her, send waves crashing heavy into waiting banks, Slow ripples, caress soft, supple shores where I get tangled, held fast, lost in forest waters, her warm flowing waters. And this is called Plastic Boats. The curb ran long and straight, clear down the street to a curb. Rainwater flowed like a river, carrying my plastic yellow boat while I gave chase to save the craft from the gutter that claimed my red boat the year before and untold others from untold neighborhood kids. If legends told stories of anxious youth on rainy days, waiting with plastic boats, ready to race down concrete curbed rivers, then I'd have a part all my own. And um, this is called Sacred. Give me something sacred, a memory that feels holy, a thought to build a life upon. Give me a path to walk, a path to wisdom, a chance to talk with God. And um, here we go, smoke. This is called smoke. Ish and Let owned this tattoo shop in Hutch. Rode Harleys, talked Sturgis, and doing hard time. Lead inked this painted skull, feathered tomahawk on my right shoulder, says spirits will lead me to glory. Ask if I'm holding. We burned good weed in my marble pipe while the shaman colored my skin, like some ancient ritual with ink and blood and smoke. Um, Turnpike Prairie. This is, this is a... We got a picture to take, Curtis, for this one. Turnpike Prairie, toll road runs north and south, a vein snaking through the Flint Hills. Limestone shone through tall grass that changes with each passing season. Weathered billboards tell folks to stop here by that, while the Midwestern sky and all of its moods stretch out over highway signs, mile markers, and power lines. Hopeful travelers count the hours and children ask when they will arrive. 
wondering eyes look past fence lines, spy rolling cattle pastures, watershed ponds. Rows of many colored cars, jeeps, pickups, semi-trucks carry the blood of a country through this Kansas turnpike prairie. And I will wrap up with a couple, I got a couple here. They're short. Well, this one's not. This is called If I Met the Devil. If I met the devil, I'd challenge him to a duel. Ten paces and I'd cheat. Beat him at his own game. I'd punch him in the face, poke him in his evil eye for all the pain, for staining our souls in the garden, at the store, on the street, in our homes, in church, in our heads. I'd ask him if he knows any of my kin, to be pesters men. I'm damned for my sins. I'd ask if I could take a dip in the river Styx. I would inquire if Virgil was a guide for all the new tenants, if they scream hopeless repentance, complain about the rent. I'd ask him why he didn't settle for number two in heaven. I'd tell him that vanity is folly. I'd ask if he missed being loved by God. I'd ask if I could pray for him. This is called Bend. Walking, I scroll the news feed, see growing numbers of sick, growing death numbers, drink my coffee while the earth ends, our lives bend under COVID-19 and we wait. Hope that curve goes flat, those numbers fall before we can't bend and it all breaks. And I will finish with this. Flim flam, it's called flim flam. Nostalgia is a technicolor lie, a commercial and I buy it. We have this phony used car salesman flim flam world. Everywhere I look, it's all for sale. Everyone has a price and we stand slack jawed, waiting to be bought, waiting to be told our worth, only to get sold in the bargain bin. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. So Michelle, it is all yours, take it away. Okay. Thank you, guys. I'm glad to be here tonight. My name is Michelle Zumbrum, and I'm a social worker, and I'm a writer's groupie, and occasionally I dabble in words. So I have three poems, very rough drafts. I haven't gone back to them in a long time. Uh, it's kind of about change and perspective. Um, so, in fact, they're so rough that they're still in notebooks. So. And they don't have titles, because I'm that cool. I'm only fiction Um Anyways, the first one starts. It's a warm summer night and my teenagers are tucked into bed and I just want to get tight because this parenting thing fills me with dread. Bob, my favorite fe female feline, is perched upon my lap. That makes writing this kind of hard, but into my creativity, I must tap, even if it's a mere sliver or just a shard. In the morning, I will face another day. More progress notes shall I compose. My teenagers will drive me cray cray, but such is life. Well, I suppose. That was my first one. And then my second one was based on a, a dream that I'd had. Uh, the river rages dirty and deep. A foot dipped into the river, feeling swept away. She grabs a pole, a rail, anything to keep the river from swallowing her whole, drowning her, lungs feeling with sludge. Somehow, some way, she pulls herself onto a dock, dirty and wet. A never ending walk up a long rickety bridge, broken pieces, a foot falling through. And then at the top of the hill, looking down, it's so steep, so narrow, it's a broken path. At the river again, it is suddenly clear, it is calm. A voice, a man says to her, beautiful, ain't it? And she stares down intently, the lucid, tranquil lake, and sees a fish swimming, feels the warm silkiness of the water. She says, yes, yes it is. And then my final poem. This isn't the life she planned, but this is the life she got. It wasn't original, and yet it was all hers. 
the cat meowing for food at midnight, the rumble of the central air battering the broken walls. She tells herself this is not the end as she stumbles, splays, bleeds from her soul. And yet that is a lie. It is an end, even if it isn't the end. And with that, I just want to thank you and hope everyone has a good night tonight. Thank you, Michelle. We, uh, we are glad you were here and we they are so glad that you do dabble in words. Uh, you, I, I enjoy hearing uh, hearing what you have to uh, to share with us. And uh, yes, Emily Dickinson uh, today. Uh, I believe international. Uh, it's an International Women's Day. What's something like that? So yeah, okay. Everybody's giving me the thumbs up. All right. So I am next. Uh, I am uh, Curtis Becker. I am uh, an author, a publisher, a teacher, and. Uh, I just have a few things that I'm going to uh, to share with you today. My first one is called Sacred Saturday. I might sleep in or maybe drink coffee at 5 a.m. The day is mine with one big promise. Anything is possible. All too quickly, the promise fades into naps chores, unexpected interruptions, and the flicker of the TV. But for that brief moment, every Saturday morning, I can do everything or nothing. The choice is mine. The choice is sacred. All right, this next one uh, I call paying bills. I practiced writing checks on old stock my mom kept in her desk. I could write with a flourish, big loops and tails on my letters, cursive, even though I didn't know cursive. The taste of envelopes and stamps, glue clings to my tongue a stack of new mail with a red flag flying, waiting for the mailman. Uh, let's see, the next one I'm going to read is called The Sky. The sky is on fire this morning. I want to stop and admire, but my eyes are on the road. 75 miles per hour, must watch for deer. Uh, let's see here. This next one, uh, I wrote after watching the, uh, the Spider-Verse. As I watch the Spider-Verse, I wonder, am I single, beer gut, Peter? How do I find MJ's door? Okay, and I have one more, uh, and this is, uh, this is more a, uh, uh, I guess, a pondering or amusing than a poem. Um, just something I was thinking about the other day. Art and literature figured out the world. Now, I spend my life figuring out art and literature. Okay, so uh, that is all for me. Uh, our next person to read is uh, Brenda White. Brenda, let's get you up here. And there we go. Brenda, take it away. Okay. There, did I unmute myself? You are great. All right. Well, I have four poems. Uh, the first one I wrote a year ago this was just right before our COVID mess started. And we had a pink moon. This is called Full Pink Moon. The moon is full and pink before Easter, blushing amid stars, planets, the Pleiades. She portends blossoms with her rose hue, 
butterflies and newborn grass, a pink pearl casting light on Earth's return to life, sprouting grass moon, egg moon, the color of surprise. She knows about redemption, victory over death. Pink is new flesh. She gleams like an ascending soul. Winter, the stone she rolls away. Uh, this next one is called Seagulls in Kansas. It's in September, there were like a gob of them. <laughs> the seagulls have flown inland, brash white against the blue sky. What are they doing here on the plains that are no longer a Bahaman sea? That was millions of years ago. Now the waters are native grass and cedar and hedge. Are the gulls on vacation? Tired of endless blues and greens stretching one horizon to another? of roiling waves and water spouts, longing for salt of the earth instead of salt water. This is a place then to snatch soybeans spilled in dirt, gorge on grains in fields instead of fish and garbage near a shore. This is the place to circle wide in an endless sky, sparkling pristine as tiny bits of glass refracting light from a setting sun. And this next one is called Solar Powered. Despite gray sky, my solar powered Cupid swings his arms left to right. Such tiny bits of light, minuscule sparks, and Cupid does a joyful dance. Could we have the chance to winnow light from dark, gather rays like grain, dance despite pain and harvest hope? It takes so little light. Cupid swinging left to right shows the way, heartbeat rocking on a single ray. And this last one is called Heartbreak in Heaven. Is there heartbreak in heaven when those few valiant souls depart, descend like dandelion seeds into matter's dense frequency, sprout and root in bodies borrowed for a blink that lasts lifespans? What are the spirit clan left behind Permeated as they are in collective soul, they have insights, glimpses into Akashic libraries of every story told or ever to be told. In a non-temporal plane, the departed have merely stepped into another room, will return in heartbeats, arms laden with stargazer lilies, baby's breath and briar. Look what we found this time. Strolling in God's gardens, arm and astral arm, even that clan must feel some ache long for the return of wandering loved ones, or do they simply watch over them, patient as mothers with their children, and find that is enough? That's all I got. Thank you, Brenda. We appreciate you uh, being here and sharing with us. Uh, we always enjoy uh, hearing from you. So our last presenter uh, of the evening is uh, ESU's own Dr. Kevin Rabus. Thank you, Curtis. Thanks for having us tonight. I'm gonna start with the poem that I wrote while I was thinking about the pandemic, Love in the Time of the Coronavirus, number one. Lisa and I watch a bad movie and after we hold hands like two kids at the theater, like young lovers on her Casey apartment couch. We don't know if the bug will pass over our house like a death angel. And so we remind ourselves it's just us here in this room this evening. Our young son gaming in his own room, his fingers clicking over the keys, face bathed in blue computer light. No blood smeared over the doorway. It's just we three here alone in this house. The wind outside like a monster. The streets all empty of cars. So I've been writing a lot of shorter poems and I visited my sister in the Great Basin area and wrote this one about a Sararo cactus. And those are the ones that have the arms up like this. So here we go. Each limb took some 100 years to grow, rooted, planted in sand, the view miles and miles flat, and will we ever get back? 
<laughs> I always wonder about that when I go out on a trip with my sister. Will I make it? Oh, uh, yeah, so far. Uh, so I've been writing a lot about Charlie Parker, Charlie Bird Parker, the bop saxophonist and genius uh, jazz person from Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri, and then New York City, California and the world. And I've, I've done a lot of research about him. And so here are a few poems about Dean Benedetti uh, listening to and capturing Bird's music with permission. Bird watcher. Dean Benedetti, alto sax in a dance band, went to gigs, recorded only the solos, only Bird, live in L.A., like a man in the woods with a mic capturing Bird song. Coda. It said Benedetti quit sax, sold drugs to keep following, listening hard for Bird. Here's another one with Benedetti. Recording Bird from the, ha from the can. Benedetti arrives early at the dial date in Hollywood, and the management says, no mics, no chords. And so Benedetti tacks an out-of-order sign on one of the back bathroom stalls, runs a discreet cord to the front table spot with a mic, and sits on the closed toilet seat, machine cradled in his lap, headphones clamped to his ears. So there's one on Benedetti bird watching. I'm going to read one from Watch Your Head 2, which uh, Curtis Becker and Kellogg Press put out not too long ago. And so this one's called Honeydew. It's a seasonal poem. That's why I picked it. I rise without a shower and go get groceries. Across the parking lot, birds chirp over the rhythm the grocery cart makes a squeal and squeak of rusted wheels. Someone knows the words to the song of spring and they're not telling. In my cart, the honeydew ripens. In my mind, a blade dives deep into the juice, parting the white veins of age and seasons past. I kind of love spring, so I'm glad that we're in this season. I'm gonna go ahead and read uh, a, a, pan, a pandemic uh, uh, send off one so that uh, I don't forget. Hold on. It's hard to say what will keep you going. Will keep, it's hard to say what will keep you going, the stroke of fingers over keys or skin, but whatever it is, I ask you to hold on. And that's from More Than Words, which just came out uh, yesterday, Tracy Million Simmons uh, edited and published that, and Lindsay Garcia helped me to curate it, and it was a joy to make. Um, I really enjoy spending some time with you, and I'm glad you were here tonight to hear the Emporia Writers Group read. We appreciate you. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you again in the fall. <laughs>